this topic is raising the gaze, um, leveraging our Asia relationships for the future. And um, we, we heard an excellent speech by the Premier setting out the global trends and the macroeconomic um, tendencies that surround the BVI at the moment. And our job as panellists uh, is to imagine the future and to um, examine some of those trends in more detail. Um, but before looking to the future, I think it's useful to look to the past. And um, Barack Obama was in Shanghai um, a year ago and um, quoted or misquoted a Chinese idiom that, um, that in order to understand the future, one must first look to the past. And um, the BVI's had a long past with um, Asia. And I'd like to ask each of the panelists if they could put themselves back, say, 20 years, and think about what as, um, the BVI has achieved in that time and what would be the biggest developments that they would see that they may not have imagined back then. Um, Wayne. Happy to start. Um, thank you, Christian. Um, uh, I, I'll comment more from the banking perspective as that's where all of my experience has been. Um, at back in 1990, uh, when I started uh, in Hong Kong at, at Citibank, um, BVI companies were, were really the domain of very ultra-wealthy um, entrepreneurs and business pe people, um, billionaires, let's say, um, who would incorporate tens or hundreds of BVI companies, and primarily BVI, not, uh, not other offshore jurisdictions. Um, and as um, the uh, emerging high net worth individual became more sophisticated, and more higher in number, um, they, they kind of learned from the super high net worth guys that this was um, a good way to, to hold their assets and transact their businesses. Um, so as um, the 90s passed and into the 2000s, um, I would say the proliferation of use of BVI companies and, and offshore companies um, became really kind of more, more the norm I would say, than just the um, domain of the uh, high, super high net worth. Um, I mean, even for someone like me, I have a BVI company, so you can see how far down um, in terms of net worth it's come uh, for us to be able to, to use the facilities and the <coughs> benefits uh, of having a BVI company. So I, I, I have seen more widespread use of BVI companies in the last 20 years. Um, much, much more commonality, um, and I think that's um, been reflected, of course, in, in the success of, of the people in this room. Process? Yeah, I mean, I think the BVI has experienced um, sort of amazing and fantastic growth over, I guess, the last uh, 25 years, and certainly in the, in the early 90s, I think much of the use of BVI came from, um, you know, places like, like Hong Kong, um, where you know you'd see um, a little bit um, sort of a lot greater sophistication. Um, China was still opening up, um, and you know although you'd see a little bit of, of it in China, primarily it was a lot of FDI foreign direct investment. I think from from Hong Kong um, sort of in into China, um, utilizing BVI particularly for a lot of cross border and, and corporate transactions. Um, and uh, BVI utilized, uh, you know, for a lot of single um, sort of holding vehicles, intermediate holding vehicles, uh, for a lot of property transactions and real estate, et cetera. Um, I think a lot of the, the BVI benefited um, from um, sort of some of the other sort of offshore jurisdictions and, and, and certain issues that they had, and, and BVI really took off over that period of time and in, in tandem with, with the growth in, in Asia and particularly in, in China. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, as, as, as Asia has, has grown, I think since then, then, and BVI has really assisted in a lot of the facilitation of the investment that Asia has has required, I think over over this period of time. I would go with what uh, Wayne and Francis had to say. I think it's the it's the all pervasiveness of BVI companies across all levels of structures, particularly that I would see in my day to day world. You'll have family members at the top with private trust companies used to organise the family wealth. There will be BVI holding companies into listed companies. 
did a bond deal the other week with the B, uh, Cayman Lisco had 102 BVI subsidiaries they used to delineate between the business and operations to manage risk, to manage taxation, to manage jurisdictional arbitrage across the business structures. And it, BVI has become the jurisdiction of choice within the corporate world, and uh, you see them everywhere. I think that's the main difference is they've become, they've come from the, the ultra high net worth holding company vehicle to being used across all structures uh, and, and all varieties of transactions. Yeah, I think from our perspective, we've hopefully helped a little bit the growth of um, BVI in Asia as we have incorporated uh, 30 years ago and, and basically drove a lot of that. But what, uh, what Wayne said about the billionaires being the, the province of billionaires, uh, I think uh, the aspiration of the average uh, wealthy or partly wealthy um, uh, Hong Kong person or Chinese person has to, has to be to have a BVI uh, structure, much in the way they want a Louis Vuitton handbag. And um, I think uh, the role, if you take a more macro level, the role that BVI has played to bring China out of basically, you could almost say third world nation, you know, 30 or 40 years ago into what is now the leading economy in the world almost, uh, is no small feat. And in a country which is basically uh, you know, language challenged, has uh, closed currency up until many years ago. BVI has single-handedly been the conduit through which China has become a, you know, a powerhouse in the world. And I think it, not many people realise that and, and how clever China has been to leverage a legal system or an infrastructure that it would never have developed itself, but just lent on the popularity of BVI as a jurisdiction. And... Uh, if you reflect on that, Premier, um, when you travel in uh, China, I think that's a point you should be uh, reinforcing, that without the BVI or jurisdictions like the BVI, China would not be where it is today. I'll just make one comment on the back of that, which is when I first started practicing, um, and I think this reflects on the work the BVI has done to make itself the Premier jurisdiction for offshore, the Cook Islands was in the listing rules in Hong Kong as a jurisdiction of choice. It was one of only four, were Hong Kong, Bermuda, Cayman, and the Cook Islands. Cook Islands, I haven't seen a Cook Islands company in 15 years. I haven't seen a Turks and Caicos company in 15 years. BVI is everywhere, and I think that is mainly down to the work of the government, uh, of regulators, and of practitioners within the industry to make sure that it remains a premier product and its uses are rolled out across, uh, across all areas. So, thanks everyone. I, I think that's really interesting. I mean, what we take away from that is over a 20 year period, just how pervasive the BVI has become. Um, but that, that looks at historic growth and we need to look at the future and I'm sure you're all aware that the Chinese markets are changing, the Southeast um, Asian markets are changing. And I wonder if um, the panel could um, perhaps explain some of the changes and the tendencies in the Asian markets at the moment and perhaps how BVI products and services might fit in with those changes. Um, would anyone like to respond? Yeah, I mean, I think within sort of the broader um, sort of Asian markets, I think BVI is, is playing um, uh, an increasingly very, very important and critical role. Um, I think historically there was a lot of cross-border trade between North America and Asia and Europe and Asia. And I think now, I think statistics have shown that increasingly more and more of that, that trade is occurring uh, inter-Asia, um, within Pan-Asia. I mean, I think there are many, many deals that China deal that, that does that doesn't touch upon Europe or, or with, with, um, with North America. So it will be dealing with you know, countries like India, Indonesia, Indochina, Malaysia, um, and that's really also part of its One Belt, One Road initiative as well as it, as it exports a lot of its products um, outwards in order to drive its economy from um, an export-driven one into a consumer-driven um, economy. And that's really um, assisting um, and, and uh, developing uh, the greater sort of Asian uh, region. Um, and then certainly the population growth is assisting in, in that as well because with between Asia Pacific, uh, Asia and the Pacific, that already constitutes about 55% of the world's population. And um, India alone um, will ex be exceeding uh, China's population in seven years' time. 
So I think you can see, I think, the, the strength of, of, of this region and, and the drivers of that, and w really with, with the Pan-Asian developments and with the TPP and the greater ASEAN, um, that's going to, you know, sort of drive quite a lot. And if you look at Indonesia as, as a country in itself, um, certainly it's got the greatest population uh, of young people, of those under 30, um, as, its w as its workforce. And that's a, a big driver, and that's why you're also seeing quite a lot of Japanese investment uh, into, uh, into, into, into places like Indonesia to drive its um, sort of consumer base. So I think um, that that's one very important aspect to, to kind of the, the 21st century of economic growth, of uh, creation of wealth, of business growth, population growth, um, very much um, driven today by, by Asia and, and, uh, and China. Um, but I think the other angle, which we spend a lot of time thinking about, is how to capture that uh, growth opportunity and how, say, for the BVI, uh, they would maintain their um, uh, the premier position um, amongst people that are incorporating companies. Because if there's so much growth that's going to happen in Asia, and we, and we can see that day, day to day, um, what, are the, what are the hurdles for BVI to not only keep its share in ratio, um, but perhaps to capture more of the share? Um, as they are a well-known household incorporation name um, and can offer products and services that, uh, that meet the needs of, of the Asian market. So, so I would say it's not just the growth that we're going to witness, um, but it's how does the BVI keep pace with it and how does it tailor its offering um, towards the needs of, of Asia and, and Chinese and Indian and you know, this region's um, entrepreneur. Yeah, I think there are two things that distinguish Asia from other parts of the world, and I, I'm, I'm not at all scared about this sort of um, recanting from globalisation. I think that's a temporary uh, populist sort of thing, and stopping globalisation is like pushing back the tide. I, I don't think it's ever going to happen. But uh, the two things that differentiate, one is the, uh, the awareness of brand that's incredibly important in, uh, in Asia. And BVI has the leading brand. So, you know, who would have thought that uh, or pick, a, pick a brand could, could get into adjacent markets so easily, uh, whether it's clothing or jewellery or, you know, you're buying Mont Blanc watches now, whereas before they were just pens. So, you know, I think the BVI has a huge opportunity to leverage the brand that it has into uh, other services and markets. Shouldn't be uh, underestimated. And the second one is, um, is that business in Asia is very intermingled with family and more than you'd find in Europe or North America. And, and this is why banking is so important. You, you cannot just choose to bank the business side of a relationship. You have to bank the personal side of a relationship. And what you're seeing is this huge flood of things like family offices happening now in China. And I think if the BVI could leverage both its brand and its uh, understanding of the individual, and the role they play into business, I think it has a very, very bright future. And uh, don't, be, uh, don't be looking to um, the West to uh, paint the way for that. I, I think that one of the leveraging, uh, one of the best key leverage points will be the familiarity that uh, people already have with BVI companies, BVI products. Um, uh, so we see the opening up of markets. We've done transactions, for example, where there's an investment into Iran, there was a China SOE, there was a UAE investor. It's very much the Premier's point. The capital sits somewhere in the world and they want to find a way to invest it in a manner that makes everyone comfortable with the structure that yeah, they are using. And after 30 years of Chinese companies using BVI companies for investment vehicles for joint ventures, the natural choice was to go to a BVI joint venture vehicle when they made that investment. Um, no other jurisdiction really was considered. It was very much that BVI was where they would go, and you've amalgamated you know, three very different legal structures and systems and packaged it through the BVI company in a way that everyone's happy. And I think that the last 30 years will pave the way for BVI to continue that growth and enable and facilitate uh, global investment. Um, following on from that, and it's probably a related question, but 
Um, I was wondering who the key drivers of future business would be, or uh, the key consumers for BVI products. Um, historically, we've seen an, a lot of growth from China and Taiwan um, due to various regulatory um, issues or jurisdictional requirements. But I, and we've touched on the growth of Indonesia and India as markets. And I just wonder, as a panel, where you think the future growth is going to come from? Will it continue to be China, but this time being out with FDI? Or do you see growth in other countries, such as Indonesia or India? I go with um, outward investment from China in particular. I, th I don't think FDI will dry up to the extent that people are, uh, uh, are believing. I think that there will still be a, a vast amount of money that flows in into more limited industries, uh, um, particularly into technology. I think in terms of outbound investment, that would be one of the key drivers. Uh, a lot of the initiatives that would push that one belt, one road, etc., uh, and all of the Chinese go abroad policies, and I think that will all drive business through very much through BVI structures. Yeah, I, I take uh, um, maybe a biased view, or a very biased view, which is that um, I think the growth will happen anyway. Um, I think the inhibitor is access to the financial system. Um, and I'll talk, of course, about that later um, in, in the Bank of Asia section, but I, I, I see the growth happening irrespective. Um, it's just um, allowing that growth to go through the BVI and be able to uh, be enabled in the financial services world, because if you can't, then, peop then this growth is going to have to go somewhere else to find its, uh, find its financial services. Yeah, I mean, I think I would agree. I mean, I think that growth is, is going to occur because I think if you look at the overall trends in terms of the, dry, the, the, the growth in the population, the high net worth growth within Asia, um, all of that money is, is, is needing to be deployed. And you can see the, the problems, the structural issues that are occurring now in China because there's not enough uh, diversity and not enough places for, for those funds to, to find a home. Um, but I think certainly um, with, with India, you're going to see a lot more uh, inward investment. Um, but definitely, I think the driver of, of China going outbound and uh, finding uh, a wider consumer base, I think, for it um, is, is, is going to uh, be, be a, a, a very large factor. Um, I think you see China looking at, um, you know, fintech um, sort of uh, infrastructure, uh, airline, um, all of those are going to be huge drivers uh, in terms of, of the various areas uh, that will be um, sort of more prominent, I think, within Asia. Just um, one more comment to, for, for me, anyway. Um, we, we made an investment in India this year uh, for two, we, we acquired two companies in India, so I've spent a lot of time this year in India. And um, India is where China was in many ways in terms of its infrastructure probably 10 years ago. And you remember at the height of the financial crisis uh, in 2008, 9, uh, China made a very bold uh, you know, commitment to helping the infrastructure and I think invested you know, nearly a trillion dollars in, in building roads, bridges, highways, airports and so on. India is exactly at that point in its... Uh, gestation period and it's um, it's needing over a trillion dollars of infrastructure investment to bring the average village to have you know uh, water and gas and electricity and so on plus roads plus uh, highways and so on the um, there is no way they'll get that money uh, in terms of equity funding it's going to have to all come from bond fin finances and and uh, corporate paper and therefore the role that uh, a jurisdiction like the BVI can play um, there will be others, obviously, Singapore, Mauritius and others uh, seeking a role there. But is exactly where China was 10 years ago. So I, I would, uh, having now been a, a relatively uh, recent uh, convert to India, I would totally encourage BVI to spread its wings there because that's the next big show in town, in my view. Thanks for the interesting um, comments. Um, stepping aside from the markets, it'd be interesting to look at what um, the current product offering is um, in the BVI. Um, we've had a lot of innovation recently. We've had um, new incubator approved funds, um, approved managers, and the arbitration um, center that's being set up. Um, I just wanted to ask the panelists what, um, 
new and evolving products they see that um, would be successful in Asia and where there may be gaps or what future products um, should be considered. I'm a, I'm a bit of an old fossil. I, I pretty much think that BVI covers its bases very well here. I'm certainly never been approached by a client who feels that BVI doesn't cover their needs. There are areas where it may want to look at some of its processes, I think. Um, Wayne touched on, on banking, and that's very much a, a process area where people are having some difficulties, but it's not specifically a BVI-related issue, but it impacts on BVI entities. But I, I think we've got most of the bases covered. It's <laughs> good to hear. I'm sure a lot of people would be very happy to hear that. <laughs> um, one related point I wanted to look at um, is the debate about volume against value. Um, we've talked about um, the products, the new markets, but um, a lot of the history of the BVI is based on the um, incorporation of efficient SPVs um, with a good commercial and quick um, uh, regulation and system to get them up and running for um, customers. Um, but there's also a concern to chase um, higher value work, um, such as um, funds and um, uh, sophisticated structures. And um, But to what extent should we be focusing on the high value work or and and how do we at the same time ensure that the the volume um is still maintained that the bvi remains the go-to jurisdiction for efficient spvs i mean i think to a large extent the the movement so the moving up the value chain is is occurring as we speak because i mean i think going back sort of 25 years ago the you know, I think the, the space that, that BVI was in is very different from now. So, for instance, now I think you see BVI very much used in a lot of the large M&A deals as the acquirer or, or in fact, as the target. Um, they're being used in debt capital markets. Um, you know, I think funds, um, you know, I think is, is, is being considered as a JV vehicle, um, et cetera. So, I think it's really important that the BVI sort of continues to sort of be involved in very substantive transactions um, and, and really being seen as a facilitator of a lot of the cross-border investment to really um, sort of bring forward and, and into the developing age of, of for instance, Asia and, and its other sort of developing economies. Um, and, and I think, you know, I think probably Martin can speak to this a little bit more, but I think in, in terms of volume, I think with, with these days and, and, and CRS and FACA, et cetera, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the volume play is, 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 is probably looked upon as, as, as not as, 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 as positively as, as before, but really looking into sort of quality of, of your clients and quality of, of the entities that are coming into the jurisdiction. And that's why really moving up the value train is 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 increasingly um, important. Um, and you know, if, if we can, you know, BVI actually is, as as um, Richard uh, had mentioned, really being used in a lot of uh, very complex uh, transactions and and a very numerous number of uh, numbers of those companies um, for very sort of legitimate and and for very sophisticated um, um, reasons. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a either or. I think it's an and. Um, certainly, BVI should not turn its back on um, volume incorporation business, because if uh, if that stopped, then Broderick and and uh, the Premier wouldn't have any money to to build <laughs> airports and roads and things, because that annuity stream of the incorporation business is what keeps the the Treasury uh, full of money. Um, but it is going to slow down, and there is. I think we're at the the point, the tipping point, where the number of new incorporations every year is not sufficient to overcome the number of lapsed structures or or liquidations um, that are happening. And when that happens, obviously you have to quickly develop, or you should have previously thought about developing other services. So, but it shouldn't turn its back on that. And I think um, if we analyse the drop in volume since say a few years ago, I think half of the reason for that here in Hong Kong is the uh, fact that the banks are making it just difficult to open bank accounts. It's not that people don't want a BVI company, but they try and open an account uh, at one of the um, 
four-digit acronym banks in town, and um, uh, and they say, look, uh, it's got the label B on it, BVI on it, so we're just not going to do it, or we're going to do it, but it's going to take three months instead of three days. And um, I reckon that that probably explains half of the drop in volume that we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, so I welcome other banks, and I, you know, I welcome the time when banks aren't just run by compliance people because um, you know they're turning away very good and profitable business. Um, I was talking to a client yesterday, a fund client who started a BVI fund three years ago and uh, managed to get a bank account open. They're now raising a new fund of a billion dollars in three years and, and another series. So, you know, that is a very lucrative business. Had they been turned away three years ago, that bank would never have enjoyed the success of that client. So it's very short-sighted to say, you know, which jurisdiction has the most suspicious transaction reports in the world. Of course it will be BVI because there's more BVI companies active than any other jurisdiction by a factor of five. So, of course, you'll see more uh, risky transactions, obviously. But that's not a reason to shut down the banking infrastructure to, to BVI. And uh, I think once we get, once the sense uh, comes back on that one, I think uh, BVI will continue to grow in the volume sector as well uh, as in the more sort of um, racy end of town. Well, thank you, Martin. We look forward to your support um, in the coming years. Um, it, the other thing I would add um, to that is, is I, would, I would say that the BVI should continue to invest in the technology uh, strategy. Um, it, the technology is improving productivity in all walks of life today. Um, and if you talk about volume, technology creates scalability. And if you talk about costs, it uh, reduces or nearly eliminates cost because of the efficiencies. Um, so, so I would just encourage that um, in, in line with what we're trying to do on the banking side, um, that the BVI continues to invest in technology and um, to build that infrastructure that creates those uh, high volumes and low cost um, opportunities. I think in terms of uh, volume versus, versus value, I think there's also a key issue here of quality, and it's quality of clients. But without trying to blow all our own trumpets, it's also quality of the service providers that wrap around the businesses that are trying to do what they want to do. Two to three years ago, there was a flight, to some extent, to other jurisdictions, and we, as a result, 12, 18 months later, started to see companies in lesser-known jurisdictions, and nothing wrong with them, but lesser-known jurisdictions pop up in structures holding companies' subsidiaries. And as in is often the way in Asia. It would be last dated instructions and you got instructed today, they wanted the legal opinion yesterday, they're going to pay you in three months time. This is fine, we're used to doing this. There is a, a lot of infrastructure that wraps around BVI companies, lawyers, service providers, accountants, that can make sure that these structures are effectively and efficiently enacted within the time frames that clients want. When you then start bringing in jurisdictions that simply don't have that quality of service provision associated with them, it falls over. And clients would come in with, for example, a Samoan company and say, I need a legal opinion in two days' time. I said, well, you're going to have to pay Trevor Stevenson at Stevenson's Lawyers about 10,000 US because he's got a four-week backlog. And, and that's the kind of service backlogs and log jams that people would encounter by stepping outside of BVI. There simply isn't the infrastructure in the service provision to make sure that people can effectively and efficiently transact. And I think provided that BVI makes sure that it provides a quality service across all spectra of what it is that people want to use the BVI entity for, then I think the, the, the volume value issue um, you know, is, is, is not as pertinent as, as otherwise we may feel. That's a, that's a final point, so actually a very good one, because when you do go to jurisdictions like that and um, there's no quick turnaround, that people actually realise just how good we are in the BVI, that it's just assumed that quick turnaround and good service. Um, I'm not going to monopolise your time because I'm sure the audience are dying to have questions as well, so i just um, raise one final question. Um, and it sort of leads on from this discussion against volume and against um, versus value. And it's about the various risks as well as the opportunities that come from the BVI. I mean, the past year, we've had um, increased tax and regulatory transparency on um, and ownership, um, as well as Panama Papers. And I was just wondering, 
how does the BVI deal with those risks, or are they actually opportunities for us? And if, if you'd like to discuss that a little. I think uh, if I could pick up the Panama Papers one, um, it's quite ironic that when, I think it was in the early 80s, 84, when Panama was the go-to jurisdiction globally for international business companies, and, uh, and it, it fell on its own sword. BVI was the biggest beneficiary of that, uh, of that shift. Suddenly all these Panamanian companies uh, re-domiciled to BVI and BVI became the, the, the role, that the premier jurisdiction that it is today. So here we are this year um, where there's been a one instance of a, a one service provider in Panama creating such a storm. Uh, I think it is quite a salutary lesson that, uh, well firstly, uh, data security, uh, but secondly, you know, every now and then you do need to shake out a little bit and, and there are people who are not doing the right things with certain companies or not disclosing that what they're doing who need to um, be a bit more transparent. And I think this will end up, this has been a tough year for the BVI and all offshore jurisdictions, but I think it will end up being a very good thing to have this awareness, to have the shakeout, to get rid of the 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 bad eggs that are spoiling the you know the whole uh, picture, and um, you know w BVI recover. BVI does a better job regulating its jurisdiction than London does, frankly, or New York does. So it should just hold its head up and just continue plowing on, and uh, don't be distracted by the sort of uh, sideshow of uh, of Panama. I, I wouldn't want to be a, a, a only reliant on Panama as a business today. That would be quite tough. I think it's it's again a lesson to us really to to focus on 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 the quality, um, but equally, um, you know, essentially that you know the messaging continues and the raising the awareness is extremely important because the media tends to take a very very um, superficial view um, that you know essentially all offshore is bad. And they, you know, may or may not understand or choose not to understand really what what the role of, of offshore is. So I think all of us have an increasingly important role to play in, in terms of really um, making both the clients as well as you know externally everybody aware of you know I think the importance of of, of offshore. Um, in the facilitation, in the intermediation, in cross-border deals, and particularly, I think, a lot of the benefits that offshore has played, particularly in emerging economies, um, to assist these economies um, accessing capital that they need. Um, and again, really, um, you know, I think trying to, trying our best, I think, to, um, you know, to raise, raise that information and, and get, that, get that information out there. I, I, with Martin, I thought Panama Papers in some ways was a, a benefit to the industry as a whole. If, if one service provider in Panama is playing fast and loose with the rules and as a result is, is removed from the industry as a whole and the industry shows that it is more than prepared to, to deal with the rotten eggs that are in it or the bad eggs, I, I think for the industry as a whole this is a good thing. It enables the BVI to clearly differentiate itself to show that it is fully internationally regulatory compliant, that it has well-regulated and licensed service providers, and that it has a quality, uh, uh, quality service providers across all, all areas, uh, legal, accounting, banking, etc. And I think if, uh, it is an opportunity for BVI. We've seen various uh, companies move in. I'm sure Francis and, and Martin have seen the, the same, where they've decided to move up uh, from their service provider. They've decided they would rather be with an oil or, or an Appleby or, 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 or a Conyers than they would be with their current service provider because they're happy with BVI but they would like the, the, the better quality gloss that the, the higher quality service provider puts upon it. And I think provided that BVI promotes the, the quality of its, of its offerings, uh, it should do well.